Hey, what's up, Nashville? This is Bo Beach, Free Speech with Bo Beach podcast, where we will discuss current Nashville commercial real estate news. We'll sprinkle in some politics, culture, and sports uh, when the local stories uh, lead us that way. Today, we're going to focus most on commercial real estate and the economy. I'm going to update you on Dolly Parton's hotel project. We're going to talk about retail vacancy lows hitting uh, Nashville and what that means for our market. We're going to talk about some creative office to apartment subsidies, right? This means what governments are doing to help developers convert office product to apartment buildings which is much easier said than done. We're going to talk about the rent versus buy equation in Nashville and how that's changed uh, from 2019 to 2023. We're going to talk about the story of Family Dollar, an interesting business discussion. We're going to talk about anti-growth Williamson County and what they've done recently with their debate about funding the local chamber of commerce. I'm gonna give you a market update, right? Something that I'm seeing as a commercial real estate broker and how this year has played out in kind of a surprising way. We're gonna talk about the average office rent in Nashville. It surprises a lot of folks how high it actually is. And then we're gonna sprinkle in a discussion of used car sales, right? So I like to track the car business because in my opinion, It is a barometer for the larger economy. Uh, So we're going to talk about used car sales and what we're seeing there. So let's get into it. Recently, Dolly Parton has come out and said, hey, we've named our hotel in downtown Nashville. It is going to be known as the Song Teller Hotel, right? And she recently also came out and said that hotel is going to be inclusive of a Dolly Parton Museum, right? So those are two very on-brand things for downtown Nashville. Uh, Singer museums, you know, musician museums, uh, plus a Dolly Parton branded hotel. Of course, that's an office building, one of the larger office transactions over the last year. It's being totally gutted. Uh, all the HVAC, all the interior build-outs on all floors except for two, one being the ground floor that's got retail tenants and the other being <clears throat> one of the upper floors that has office tenants that are still locked into longer-term leases. So they're just demolishing everything else they can and starting over from the building shell. A very, very ambitious and costly project. Nevertheless, I think it'll be successful. Uh, let's keep moving. Retail vacancy has reached record lows in Nashville. You know, I've been around long enough where I can remember retail being the asset class that people wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. And now we've got some of the lowest retail vacancy in the country. We are at 3% vacancy, officially the lowest in the United States 27% below the five-year average for retail vacancy. Nashville is one of just four cities from the top 10 fastest growing list that are not located in Florida or Texas, right? So most of the growing metro areas in this country are in Florida and Texas. If you carve them out, there are four left out of the top 10 Nashville is one of them. That is really driving most of the demand for retail space. You know, business follows people. People want to be in Nashville. Business are following people to Nashville and scooping up all of the retail vacancy that we have available. The uses that are dominating right now are grocery and fitness. In fact, there has been a 1.2 million square foot net absorption in the last year. Absorption means the amount of vacant space that has been absorbed or taken 
So we've, we've added 1.2 million square feet of occupied space over the last year. It gets even more competitive for those properties that are 5,000 square feet or less, right? So any building that's 5,000 square feet or less has a 2.1% vacancy rate. So retail has become very, very competitive. And as I've spoken to other brokers about this and kind of picked their brains on, on what's going on here, I was recently at a tour with a broker that specializes in tenant rep work. He was telling me about how he's working with this large retail tenant. I said, well, it's got to be difficult in today's market. You know, there's very, very little vacant space to put them in. And he was of the opinion that there's going to be a big rollover of vacant space uh, coming up. And perhaps this is going to sort itself out sooner than later. I'm not sure I believe that, right? Because obviously landlords know when their, space, their leases are rolling over. They know it a long time in advance and they can start actively marketing those spaces before they actually become vacant. You know, with a 3% vacancy rate on larger properties and a 2.1 vacancy rate on smaller retail properties, most of those landlords are going to have a replacement tenant lined up before that tenant even moves out, right? So I think if you are a owner of retail space in Nashville, you are very, very confident in your position and I don't see anything really that's going to disrupt this. You know, retail space is not being developed at any type of rate that's going to solve this problem. Uh, you know, I think we're just in a marketplace in Nashville where we're underbuilt given how many people are here now. And we've got a long way to go before supply is ever going to outpace demand because we're going to continue to grow our population base and our commercial property base is not keeping up. We've started, we're actually starting from a huge deficit, right? So the population keeps growing. At minimum, we might chip away at the deficit. I don't think we're ever going to get out in front of demand. So I think the future looks very bright for retail in the Nashville area. Let's move on. So one of the big discussions we're having, and this is not a discussion we're having a lot in Nashville because of all the demand we have for our office space here. We don't really have an office space issue in Nashville, but most metro areas of similar size are struggling with vacant office space and landlords are trying to decide what to do with it. The obvious thing to do is convert office space to apartments, right? Because most metro areas are still light on rental housing. Calgary, Alberta, Canada has uh, instituted a creative way to help developers kind of uh, finance these projects, right? Because they're very hard to pencil out. The cost to convert an office building to an apartment building is very, very high in terms of the construction cost. So what Calgary, Alberta, Canada has done is they've said, hey, we are going to give you $55 per square foot in cash from the government to the developers to help cover the cost of these office building conversions, right? And they're doing so <clears throat> with no affordable housing requirements, right? When you hear affordable housing, what that means is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's early here. What that means is the government is forcing the property owner to offer those units at a below market rate for those residents that qualify, right? So there's income restrictions, right? You can't make too much money and then also get a subsidized or a below market rent on that unit. And in the United States, anytime the government is providing any level of assistance for an apartment project, they're almost always requiring a certain amount of units be set aside and be termed affordable, right? Affordable apartments are a very difficult business to be in. It's hard to get them to pencil out even with the minimal government contribution. 
Usually, in the U.S., the government con uh, contribution is simply property tax breaks, right? Whereby you, you are not going to have to pay any type of real estate tax for a certain period of time. Or perhaps the benefit given to the developer is something as simple as a zoning change, right? So in the U.S., we're much, uh, we aren't helping nearly as much as they are in their model in Calgary, Alberta. The challenge is, even with the $55 per square foot contribution from the government, the buyer, the developer that's going to convert these buildings, still has to pay a price similar to the value of the land. So even though the office building is sitting on the land, and the shell of that office building will be repurposed into the shell of the apartment building, for the numbers to work, given the extremely high cost of construction, the buyer still has to acquire that office building at a price similar to the value of the underlying land for it to pencil out, even with the $55 per square foot, because the construction costs are so high. Uh, we have a record 13.8% vacancy rate in the United States in the office sector right now. Again, this is not really uh, an issue in Nashville. Nationally, it is an issue. You know, I've come from a, uh, many years ago, right? But I've come from a market called Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that is the opposite of Nashville, right? Milwaukee, Wisconsin's best years are behind it, right? So they were a manufacturing base for a long time. They had all of this office building uh, construction to support that manufacturing base. Most of that, ma most of those manufacturers have left, and there's much less demand for office space in Milwaukee, which is why you're seeing a lot of office to apartment conversions. So that is a market that's really trying to figure out, hey, what do we do with all these office buildings that we don't need and aren't very valuable now? This would be a solution for a market like that. The catch here is you've got to be a pretty well-funded developer to make this happen because that $55 subsidy from the government is only paid out after the project is actually complete. So they're actually kind of refunding a portion of the cost of the project, but you can't have that money until the project is complete. So it's not a perfect solution, but it's a much more aggressive solution that we're seeing in the United States. So we'll see where this goes, you know, in, in markets like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, like Chicago, Illinois, those type of markets where it's best days are behind it. You've got too much office space and it doesn't pencil out to convert it we may see the local municipalities start actually writing checks to developers to fill the gaps in their construction budget in addition to property tax breaks and approving zoning changes. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, to my knowledge, that is the only market that has actually been writing checks to developers to encourage this type of behavior, which I welcome, right? Let's move on. <clears throat> Let's talk about the rent versus buy calculation in Nashville. And now this is from the perspective of the residential market, right? Where people live, right? Mortgage payments, including taxes, have gone up 75% since 2019. Thank you, Joe Biden, for everything that you've done for us. This, this has been really helpful for the average person here in the United States. You tried to create a utopian uh, experience here in the U.S., but what the Democratic Democrat lawmakers never factor in is the unintended consequences of their ideas. And we have been suffering through unintended consequence after unintended consequence for three and a half years. And 75% increase in the cost of Home ownership since 2019 is one of those un unintended consequences. For whatever reason, the Democrat lawmakers at the federal level think there is no amount of money uh, that is going to damage the economy. So they just keep printing money and printing money and printing money. And what we've seen is this is not utopia. 
this is the real world and printing money and having absolutely no plan to really pay our debt off is going to cost you. There's no way around it. This is not utopia. This is the real world. And now we continue to waste money, including paying off existing student debts with money we don't even have. And the situation just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And I pray in November we have a change of leadership so we can get right back on a, a more reasonable fiscal path. Now, between 2012 and 2019, a new home mortgage payment was 1.5 times the average monthly apartment rent, right? So 1.5 times higher than the, the amount you'd pay for an apartment to make a payment on a new home, yeah? In 2023, the calculation in Nashville is now 2.5 times higher. So it is 2.5 times higher to make a mortgage payment than it would be to make a apartment rent payment for a similar sized home. That's higher, that multiple of 2.5 is higher than New York City, Boston, and Atlanta. What this means for Nashville is if you didn't already acquire a home while interest rates were low, it is going to be extremely difficult to transition to owning from renting. And I've recently heard, and I can't recall, uh, it may have been RFK that said this, but it was they, they pulled young voters on what issue is most important to them. And the answer was housing, right? They want to be able to be in a position to buy themselves a home. And the reason this is the number one issue is that multiple has gone from 1.5 to 2.5. It's very difficult right now as a young person to get into their first home. It is two and a half times higher monthly payment every month to be in a home you own versus a home you rent, which is why a lot of these young people feel so helpless. And I totally get it. You know, as soon as I left college, I rented for less than a year before I bought our first home. And, uh, you know, it was always my intention to be a homeowner. I, I did not want to be a tenant. I wanted to not only buy a home, but I wanted to buy a home that had upside, right? I would make improvements build equity, try to get ahead in life, right? The young person that's leaving college today is in a pretty hopeless situation. It is very difficult to buy into today's market, and I totally understand their pain, and it makes perfect sense to me that that is the number one issue uh, related to young people. Let's keep moving. Family dollar, right? This is a, a discussion of... Uh, businesses consolidating, right? So Family Dollar is for sale. They have 8,000 stores approximately across this country. That is a lot of stores, right? In 2015, Dollar Tree paid $9 billion to acquire Family Dollar, right? The idea was there would be economies of scale and synergies, right? And that is just gobbledygook. Once you start hearing economies of scales and synergies being the reason for an acquisition, I would run in the other direction because that's easier said than done, right? Dollar Tree has been pulled down. Their financial performance has been pulled down by the financial performance of family dollar, right? So they're trying to cut their losses here. They expect to take a loss. The buyer is likely private equity who may just divide up groups of stores and sell them off in groups to different smaller buyers. Or if there is not a buyer out there that is willing to pay a price that makes sense to Dollar Tree, they may just spin family dollar into its own entity 
and manage it differently than they're managing them together, right? So really what's trying, to, Dollar Tree is trying to get this noose off from around their neck before they suffocate. You know, the, the challenge is Family Dollar and Dollar Tree, they're different, right? They, they're not direct competitors. They have different kinds of markets and different customer bases. Dollar Tree is more of a suburban brand that's trying to appeal to mid to high income shoppers, where Family Dollar is located in more urban locations and uh, are targeting a more low to mid income consumer. Keep in mind their rural counterpart, right, is Dollar General. So Family Dollar competes with Dollar General. Family Dollar is located in urban locations. Dollar General, their rural counterpart, is located in smaller towns around this country. The interesting thing about Dollar General, of course, is they're headquartered here in Nashville, specifically in Goodlettsville. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. With Dollar General being the biggest competitor to Family Dollar, Family jo Dollar underperforming, and uh, they're trying. They're either going to get spun out or sold off. Uh, either way, I think this benefits Dollar General, uh, but it'll see. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. There are very few buyers out there that are in a position to make sense of eight thousand urban stores that appeal to a low to mid income mid income buyer. So keep an eye on that story. That is a perfect example of making an acquisition without a real definitive reason why. If you're going to tell me it's economies of scale and synergies, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, somebody just got out of grad school and is not a, a real business person because that's not as easy as it sounds. You know, synergies is one of the worst words. Anybody that's talking to me about synergies, I'm not taking seriously. Let's move on. Let's talk about anti-growth Williamson County. It hurts me to say that. I am a Williamson County resident and proud to be, uh, but I do not agree with their current shift to an anti-growth position. The Chamber of Commerce in Williamson County is called Williamson Inc., right? This has been a source of drama in Williamson County because uh, the county provides funding of $400,000 to Williamson Inc. every year. This is 30% of Williamson Inc.'s budget, right? So the stated purpose historically for that $400,000 contribution was Williamson Inc. was required to generate 25 relocations or expansions per year and a job creation rate 25% above the average right? So this was incentive, right? You can get 25 corporate relo relocations for $400,000. As a government entity, that is an outstanding return on investment. But given our elected leaders' uh, silliness, right? I'm trying to be nice here. Silliness. They've now decided we ha we've had enough, We've had enough corporate relocations. We've, we've got enough jobs here. We don't need any more growth. We don't need any more tax space. We don't need any more jobs. We've had enough, they say. Despicable point of view, in my opinion. Now, in exchange for the 400000 which they actually approved in the budget, and then they had folks fighting against actually paying it out, they've agreed to pay it out, but with new goals, Okay. Now their new goals and their infinite wisdom, 48 business retention meetings, right? So instead of actually bringing new business to town, the, the corporate hub of Williamson County, now we're just going to have 48 meetings with existing businesses to do a wellness check and to discuss potential expansions. They're also going to continue to run the Franklin Innovation Center for Startups, which I don't know a whole lot about, but that seems like a pretty noble cause. 
but instead of 25 corporate relocations and job creation, 25% above average, now we're just going to have 48 meetings with businesses that are already here to see how they're doing and to discuss expansions. Keep in mind, Williamson County landed more economic development projects than any other county in Tennessee last year. So this is a self-inflicted wound. This is an unforced error. We are seeing anti-growth sentiment across Nashville in Davidson County and Sumner County, now in Williamson County, and I think it is absolutely shameful. You spoiled brats. You've got everything going for you that other municipalities across this country only dream of. And you are intentionally stopping it. For what? Because you like the way things are now? This not in my backyard stuff? This, oh, we're here now, let's cut everybody else off type idea? What an anti-growth foolish perspective to take in all of those counties, but especially Williamson County, which should know better. Let's keep moving. I'm going to give you a quick market update. So I'm a commercial real estate broker. Okay. That's how I feed my family. I like to think I'm one of the top performing brokers in the market and in the Southeast. And my specialty is listing and selling commercial properties, right? So I don't do any leasing. I don't do any buyer work. Uh, we don't do any property management. We're very, very focused on uh, what's called what's called investment sales, which is essentially listing and selling commercial properties. Right. The first quarter of this year uh, was solid. Right. It, it was very similar to 2023. Out of good 2023, we we head into the first quarter. First quarter is going as planned. As soon as we get into that second quarter, April, May. The entire market just paused. Activity just stopped. And I don't know why that is, right? But as soon as we got into the second quarter, activity absolutely paused. Once we got into June, activity has picked back up again. So we're now trending in the right direction, right? I will tell you that the properties that are most difficult to sell today, one being land, right? So land costs are high in Nashville, but what's more difficult than the cost of the land is the cost of the financing and the cost of the construction. So you're getting hit kind of three ways, right? High land cost, high interest rate cost, high construction cost, and you've got lenders that are out there that are really kind of pulling back on lending on these types of projects. So it's become very, very difficult to sell land at a premium price. The land that's trading is trading at uh, what is perceived to be discounts from market value. And even then, those properties often have existing tenants on them that are covering some of the costs uh, while that property is being held and permitted and all the good things that it takes to get approval to actually redevelop land. It could take up to a year to get all the necessary approval. And at these interest rates, you're, you, you've got a lot of cash going out for that first year. Uh, so if you've got an existing tenant on the property that's covering some of your costs, that makes it more attractive. But I will tell you right now, the most difficult asset class to sell, in my opinion, is land. It's not impossible. You know, I'm working on a $4.75 million land deal right now that we're, we're trying to get over the finish line. So it's not impossible, but it's a very difficult asset class to sell, which wasn't true two years ago. I would also tell you the asset class that's struggling more than you would expect is short-term rentals, right? The Airbnb business. That was a very, very hot asset class for a long time in Nashville. Many, many residential properties were built with short-term rentals in mind. Now the spigot has kind of gotten turned off in that category. Many of those properties are underperforming. They're hitting the market at premium prices. The historical earnings of those properties do not justify the prices being asked for them. So there is a lot of product on the market that's just sitting there. So I would tell you, we had a two-month pause at the beginning of the second quarter. Activity is really ramping back up, thankfully. But the property is still real difficult to sell land and short-term rentals. Let's keep moving. What I think is true is the average office rent in Nashville is much higher than you would suspect it to be, right? 
The average office rent in Nashville today is $40 per square foot, right? That's annually, right? So if you multiply that times the square foot of the space that you're renting and divide by 12, you get your monthly rent. That is a very, very high cost. Uh, again, I mentioned Milwaukee earlier, right? When we lived in Milwaukee, we did a lot of office deals, right? We, we did a lot of leasing there. And I'll tell you, we would do lease deals at $12 a square foot, $15 per square foot, 18 if you're lucky in, in Milwaukee. We're doing $40 per square foot in Nashville all day. On new construction, we're talking $50 per square foot. So office rents are very high. And still, we do not have a glut of vacant office space in Nashville, which really speaks to the strength of the Nashville market. I will tell you that businesses that are moving to Nashville are very surprised by the cost of office space. They assume it's lower than it actually is, and there's a little bit of sticker shock there. This is going to put pressure on offices in that many of these tenants are going to try to lease as little space as possible, cram as many people in as little space as possible. And that is going to pull your monthly office rent cost down pretty substantially. Last, let's talk about used cars, right? Which I think is interesting. You know, if, if you study the car market, the used car market and the new car market, I think it tells you a lot about consumer confidence it tells you a lot about how tapped out the average consumer really is. So let's compare 2022 versus 2024 car sales, right? And what I've learned is most car buyers don't buy a car. They buy a payment. And what I mean by that is when they go car shopping, they're really trying to find the car that amounts to the payment that they can afford. So if they can buy afford a, a $600 car payment, they are sh specifically shopping at price points that are going to amount to a $600 car price rather than going out and saying, hey, this is the car that I want, right? So from 2022 to 2024, prices are down 20%, right? The challenge is interest rates up, are up 20%, so they're offsetting. The payments are the same. So the average car payment today for a used car is $600 per month. I would, that would tell me, I don't have the data in front of me, but the average new car payment is somewhere near 1000 if I had to guess. So you've got used car prices coming down 2022 versus 2024, but at the exact same th time, you've got interest rates going up, which is offsetting. So the, the average used car buyer is getting no relief. You know, they're getting, uh, they're getting cars at lower prices but are paying a higher interest rate. So that's, this is a good thing if you're a cash car buyer, right? But if you've got to use uh, financing, uh, this is a difficult thing. So you can't take advantage of the drop in car prices. In the average used car, uh, monthly payment, $600 per month, which sounds like a lot to me. I, I'm a guy that pays cash for cars, so I don't think a whole lot of car, about car payments. Uh, but for the average person, $600 per month is no joke, and that's not really buying you that nice of a car. So all of the interest, or most of the interest in the used car business and the new car business is now at those lower price points. Those higher price point cars are the ones sitting on the lot. The lower price point cars are the ones flying off the lot. And that's because buyers are really working with what they can afford on a monthly payment rather than picking the exact car that they actually want. So that's what I've got for you today, y'all. I appreciate you so much for tuning in. I, I hope you'll follow us wherever you're listening. We've we're going to drop one new podcast episode every week. We've got some exciting things planned behind the scenes to make it bigger and better and more interesting. Uh, so please stick with us. We're going to get better every week. We're going to continue to provide you with what we believe are very informative and interesting stories around Nashville and around the country. Thanks so much. Talk to you next week.